Well, it's December 31st, which means that today is the statistically deadliest day of the year, or as my family insists I call it, New Year's Eve. All around the world, those of us who survived will be counting down the minutes and seconds until a completely arbitrary moment we've all collectively agreed is midnight. But that got me thinking. Who decides that that moment is midnight, and not say three seconds earlier or half a millisecond later, and how do they keep the entire world in perfect sync? Well, time as we know it actually started on October 22nd, 1884, and because that sentence sounds like the opening of a particularly awful episode of The Twilight Zone, let me back up a little bit. For most of human history, timekeeping wasn't standardized at all. In fact, it wasn't even tracked in any sort of consistent or precise way. Telling an early medieval peasant that you wasted quote 4 minutes and 25 seconds of your life watching a quote stupid video about timekeeping because you quote unsubscribe from half as interesting would have confused them for every reason, but especially because of the idea that your day could be broken into minutes and seconds. Hours weren't even invented until the 13th century, and seconds didn't catch on until hundreds of years after that. But even after we popularized mechanical clocks during the Renaissance, there was still a second problem. Those clocks didn't always line up. If your pocket watch was a few minutes ahead of your friend's pocket watch, it was hard to know whose watch was more right. Some people managed to turn this confusion into a business, like a 19th century English woman named Ruth Belleville who made her living selling people the correct time. And if that sounds stupid to you, just wait until Jeff Bezos buys up all the world's clocks and launches a service called Primetime. With no official way to standardize time, there also weren't any formal time zones. This wasn't a big deal for most people, since communication and transportation were so slow that you couldn't really interact with people who would be in a different time zone anyway. If you were living in Yield London, you didn't need to know what time it was in Berlin, just like how you, the viewer, don't need to know what time it is in places like Jupiter or Rhode Island. Time was a local thing, with towns or companies setting the time for people nearby. But as trains became more common, and going from one town to another didn't take 16 days and three amputations, having a hundred tiny time zones along your train route became, to use an industry term, very, very annoying. Here's a table of East Coast time zones in 1857. When it was noon in DC, it was 12.012 in Baltimore, 12.08 in Philly, and 12.12 in New York. If this is already giving you a headache, just try to imagine feeling that all the time, plus whatever it feels like to have cholera, and boom! That's what being a 19th century train conductor was like. Eventually, the railroads, at least in America, got so fed up that they said, hey guys, guess what? We control time now, and broke the US and Canada into five time zones. Not wanting to be upstaged by a bunch of professional train geeks, US President Chester A. Arthur said, wait a minute, I'm the gosh darn president of the United States, gosh darn it, I should be the one who decides what gosh darn time it is. And so he summoned an international conference of 26 countries, specifically these ones, to finally create standardized time zones across the globe. The only question was, where should the time zones start? At the time, maps used lots of different reference lines for their meridian, like Paris, Cadiz, Oslo, and even the Canary Islands, but a sizable majority used the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England, so that's ultimately what they voted for. On October 22, 1884, the world was put on Greenwich Mean Time, with 24 time zones in one hour deviations from whatever the clock said at the Royal Observatory. And of course, all the countries in the world joined hands and said, great, we love England, they're our best friends in the whole world, and have never tried to kill everyone in our country for some nutmeg. Let's totally schedule our daily lives around one of their clocks. But plot twist, that didn't happen at all. It actually took years for Greenwich Mean Time to be accepted internationally. France stayed 9 minutes and 21 seconds ahead until 1911, Ireland stayed 25 minutes and 21 seconds behind until 1916, and some countries still use non-standard time zones to this very day. Nepal stays 45 minutes ahead, opting to base their time around the sun's position over this mountain, Venezuela has moved their time backwards and forwards a half hour for energy-related reasons, and China erased four of their five time zones as an epic prank on the region of Xinjiang. So one answer to the question of who decides what time it is, is countries. Because countries have guns, and clocks don't. But assuming you live in a country that caved to those British time fascists and adopted Greenwich Mean Time, is the time on your phone or laptop or fancy toaster still based on the sun's position in Greenwich? Well, no. Not technically. And that's because, in the 1960s, Greenwich Mean Time got phased out for Coordinated Universal Time, which is effectively the same as Greenwich Mean Time, but with a little hat on it that says science. You see, as the world began to use things like GPS satellites that require time measurements down to the billionths of a second, the Royal Observatory's royal observations just wouldn't cut it anymore. Instead, the Coordinated Universal Time is tracked with an atomic clock, 
which I do a pretty bad job of explaining in this video if you want a pretty bad explanation of atomic clocks, but the basic idea is they are very accurate and consistent and use atoms. So which atomic clock is coordinated universal time based on? Well, it's actually calculated using a weighted average of more than 400 atomic clocks in laboratories around the world, plus or minus a few leap seconds, which I also explained in that last video. All of this is organized by the International Telecommunications Union, part of the United Nations based in Geneva. So that's your culprit, folks. The people who technically decide what time it is, a relatively unknown group of Swiss people who work for the UN. Of course, the impending new year means now's the season when people arbitrarily use the fourth digit ticking over to motivate themselves into improving themselves, but of course it rarely works. The problem is that people try to motivate themselves to do something they don't want to do, rather than making time for something they enjoy that also works as self-improvement simultaneously. That's why I think Brilliant's so great. I find their courses super interesting, engaging, and an enjoyable way to pass free time. A lot of the reason that is is because Brilliant helps me learn STEM concepts that I just could not grasp in high school. I was notoriously bad at math, but I can finally start to grasp calculus thanks to their Road to Calculus courses. They also have courses on concepts that you probably never approached in school, like quantum computing, machine learning, and logic. Brilliant doesn't focus on making sure the info you need for a subject is just in the course. They focus on designing their course so the way in which they feed you the information means you can genuinely actually grasp the concepts when complete. So click the button on screen or head to brilliant.org HAI to sign up, and if you're in the first 200, you'll get 20% off.